I'm Flor, and I'm extremely happy to introduce Leia, um, who is here um, visiting CFA for today and tomorrow. She originally did her uh, bachelor's degree in Berkeley, and after which she actually did her PhD and master's in uh, Santa Barbara. Um, during which she actually also kind of traveled around, including in Arizona, the Stewart Observatory, and uh, here at the BHI. And actually some of you might know her because she also did her RAU here like almost 10 years ago, yeah. I think we discovered today, so uh, lots of visits uh, here and there. Um, she's now a postdoc, NSF postdoc fellow at the Institute for Science Studies. Um, and she works, as you will see in the talk, a lot on uh, imaging supermassive black holes and doing a lot of computational and theoretical simulations. She's part of the EHP and also recently was announced to be one of the most inspiring women in science by nature. So, among many other things, I'll give it to you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction and thank you so much for the very kind invitation. I'm really, really happy to be back in the CFA and, and getting to, to see all of you again. Um, I know that there's a lot of people in the audience that work on EHT and so I'm sure a lot of you have probably heard a lot about EHT work. Um, because of that, I have removed a few of my introductory slides. <laughs> um, and in particular, I'm going to be talking today about um, the sixth paper in the recent Sajay Star EHT publications that were published on May 12th. So specifically, it's a paper that focuses on how we can use these results to test fundamental physics, specifically test whether or not black holes in space are occur. And um, the reason I'm focusing on that is that I co-led that paper with Maria Felicia de Laurentiis. And before I move on from my title slide, I want to just give you a little bit of an introduction about what it is you're all staring at here. Uh, most of you probably already know that this is a simulation of a black hole. This is from general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulations. And then on top of that, we add on all of the ray tracing and radiative transfer simulations as well. The reason I wanted to show this today, though, is that this is actually a free color image. So blue is 1.3 millimeter wavelength. That's the wavelength that the EHT observes at. Green is 0.8 millimeters. It's the wavelength that the EHT will observe at hopefully very soon. And red is 3 millimeters. The gravitationally relevant feature in this image that we will be talking about today is this very thin right, white ring that you can see here that is completely constant while everything else varies around it. That's actually the boundary of the black hole shadow. The reason that I wanted to show the free color image is that it shows that it's white, and therefore it is actually achromatic over the wavelength range that we are looking at here. Okay, so whenever I'm giving a testing gravity talk, I always like to be really, really explicit about what it is that we are sensitive to and what it is that we really are completely insensitive to. So in paper six, we included this Venn diagram as a figure there. And um, what I really want to focus on here, though, is just comparing what we can do with black hole shadows of the HT and what we can do with black hole, black hole gravitational waves. So when we're dealing with gravitational waves, I know there are several people here that work on that, we're dealing with a really dynamical space time. And that means that we're going to be really sensitive to the dynamical aspects of the theory, specifically Einstein's equations and kind of how that space time is going to change as a function of time. However, if you contrast that to what we can do with the EHT, we essentially have a supermassive black hole that has a really small amount of mass swirling around it. We essentially treat that mass as negligible. We say that it doesn't really affect the actual space time of the black hole significantly. And so we have a stationary black hole essentially in vacuum. What that means is that when we are doing tests of gravity with the EHT, we are really just testing the black hole metric. Okay, so you can think about this as essentially a no hair theorem test. We're testing whether black holes in space are consistent with the Kerr prediction or not. And we don't have to worry about any of the dynamical aspects of the theory. And so I've already kind of alluded to what the black hole shadow is, but I do want to define it here. So the way that I like to define this feature is really just using an impact parameter. So the idea here is that we have, in, shown in black here, this is the event horizon, and green is the photon orbit. I'm going to evolve the trajectory of photons as they move towards this black hole. You will see that all of the blue photons will fall in, all of the red photons will escape. So the way that we define the boundary of the black hole shadow is by the critical impact parameter between these blue photons and these red photons, or in other words, the critical impact parameter between a photon that falls into the black hole and a photon that escapes. 
The overall size of the black hole shadow is about two and a half times larger than the size of the event horizon itself. I do want to point out, though, that if you were to follow the trajectory of a photon right at the boundary, what you'll see is that that photon is essentially tangent to the photon orbit. Okay, what that means is that you can also think of the black hole shadow as the lensed photon orbit. Mathematically, you'll arrive at the same solution. So the diagram that I just showed you, question? No? Okay. So the diagram that I just showed you was for a black hole that was not spinning. But of course, we do expect that black holes in space will have spin. So the next obvious question for us to ask ourselves is how does spin affect the size and the shape of the black hole shadow? So this blue circle here, this is the size of the black hole shadow for a short child black hole. When I play the animation, you will all be observers at the equator, and the spin axis will be pointing up. Okay, so as spin increases, you'll see that the shadow moves over to the right. But at least so far, the size and the shape really hasn't changed that much. It's only when we get to really high spins that we create this deviation from circularity that you see here. So this is a pretty significant dent in our shadow when we look at it with, with our eyes. But if you calculate the asymmetry of this shape mathematically, you'll find that it's really not that different from a black hole. It's actually, sorry, from a circle. It's still pretty low asymmetry. What that means in practice is that it's such low asymmetry that we actually can't constrain this level of, of deviation from circularity with what we have so far with the EHT. If you look at every possible black hole shadow size, so every inclination and every spin, you'll find that the shadow ranges from about 4.8 to 5.2 gm over c squared. That's about plus or minus 4%, which again is way too small compared to what we currently have with the EHT. So you can look at it from two perspectives. You can be a little pessimistic and say this is really terrible that we can't use the size and the shape of the black hole shadow with current EHT observations to measure spin. Or you can be a little bit more optimistic and say that this is actually really great because it means that we can use the size and the shape to test whether black holes in space are consistent with the Kerr prediction without having to worry about the effects of spin since they aren't really that important. Okay. So I have defined the black hole shadow in a way that depends only on the geometry of the black hole itself and does not depend on any astrophysical effects. However, of course, the image that we actually see does depend on astrophysical effects. So we need to also consider how does the ob observed ring of emission relate to this black hole shadow feature. So in both paper six of the 2019 M87 publications, as well as paper six of the 2022 Sajay Star publications, um, we identify essentially free conditions, and we argue that if those conditions are met, then this ob observational ring will be related to this analytically defined ring. So first, we need to have enough photons to actually illuminate the black hole. Otherwise, we just won't see anything. Second, the emission has to originate close enough to the black hole so, to, so that it will be gravitationally lens around it, but still primarily outside of the photon orbit. And finally, the plasma that is around the black hole has to be sufficiently transparent so that you can see through it to actually see the black hole shadow. So the top right uh, animation here, this is really meant to illustrate your f this third bullet point, so the fact that we need it to be optically transparent. What you're looking at right now is radiation that has a wavelength of one centimeter. One centimeter, that condition is not met. Um, the disk is not transparent. And you can see this kind of orange structure here. This, this is this big poofy disk. Um, I should also emphasize that for both Sag A star and M87, we are dealing with really low luminosity accretion flows. This means that we don't expect them to settle down into a thin disk, but instead we'll see this poofy kind of donut shape like what you see here. And that is really important um, for our models. Okay, so I'm gonna play the animation. It's gonna go from one centimeter all the way down to 1.3 millimeters, and we'll see how the optical depth changes so we can see through the disk all the way down to the black hole shadow itself. I wanna also uh, talk a little bit about the figure here at the bottom. So here we have another simulation, again at 1.3 millimeter wavelength, and then I have horizontal and vertical cross sections of the image on the left here. These dashed vertical lines are, again, the analytically calculated black hole shadow boundary. I'm going to play the animation, and we'll see that there is a lot of variability, but there's this very thin little spike that's right at the black hole shadow boundary. Um, I want to emphasize that none of the results that I'm going to be talking about today actually depend on us detecting this very thin little spike. Okay, the reason for that is that even though it is really bright, the fact that it's thin means that it really doesn't contribute that much to the total flux that we observe. And specifically, 
how much of the total flux we observe will be from this little spike is model dependent, okay? So we try to stay away from these model dependent statements and what we're really gonna argue is that this broader peak that you see here at the bottom, it's actually really hard to create a situation where the boundary of the black hole shadow is completely disjoint from this broader peak that you see here. Even with all of the variability going on here, it's still really hard for us to create a situation where you have a ring that is completely unrelated from the black hole shadow. And so the arguments I gave you might seem a little hand wavy. So we did actually calibrate this. Um, and this is a really big part of what we did for paper six. And so the way that we've done this is that we've separated our uncertainty into kind of measurement uncertainty and theoretical uncertainty. So I wanna walk you through this. So the total calibration parameter we call alpha C and that's a product of alpha one and alpha two. Alpha one is what we call the theoretical uncertainty. This is the difference between this analytically defined black hole shadow radius and what we see as a bright ring and what I consider to be the perfect image, right? This is the result of a simulation where you have effectively perfect resolution. And then alpha two is the difference between the ring that you see in this perfect image and the ring and you see in the image that the EHT actually observes. These are our measurement uncertainties effectively. And then the way that we actually define um, this delta, which is the fractional deviation parameter, this is really what we're trying to constrain. This is how much um, you can deviate away from the predictions of short child. Um, so we measure this diameter M. We use uh, a lot of simulations for alpha C. D sh shadow short child is just square root of 27 GM over C squared. And then we solve for delta. And so for alpha one, what we do is we used hundreds of thousands of images from GRMHD simulations to find del uh, alpha one, okay? And so what's really important to keep in mind here is that the way that we actually do this is using a feature extraction algorithm applied to all of these high resolution GRMHD simulation images. And I also wanna emphasize that we did not limit ourselves to only images or simulations that are actually consistent with SAJ star but we did include the full set of simulations that we had, um, even, even those simulations that are really not consistent with what we see for SAJ star And so in orange, um, we're showing a similar thing, but instead of GRMHD, we're actually using an analytic accretion model. So the idea here is that there are certain assumptions that go into GRMHD. We did not want to limit ourselves to just those assumptions. And so we also used an analytic accretion model that loosens some of those assumptions and tries to be more general. And again, we're trying to see if we can break this relationship between these the geometric ring and the observational ring. And again, um, we don't really break it, right? We, we're still having uh, an alpha one calibration that, that is quite reasonable. And then we also wanted to see the effects of using a metric that is different from Kerr. So in green, we're showing the effects um, or we're showing a calibration where we use the same analytic accretion model, but we also use non-Kerr metrics here. Okay, so again, no matter what we do, we get a pretty similar alpha one calibration. I wanna emphasize here that we did not try to combine all of these into one, but what we actually do is treat all of these separately and do our full analysis assuming one and then do everything again assuming the other and see what our final delta constraints are with, with each of these separately. And so for alpha two, what we did was we used about 150 or so uh, synthetic data sets and this was all done completely blindly. Several people in this room worked on this. We very much appreciate um, the work that, that was done uh, on analyzing all of these 150 data sets. And the idea here is that um, we tried to create images that both matched what we expect for Sag Star, but also don't match. Um, in, we did this in um, the features that we see in the Fourier domain, as well as the actual like salient image features. We did this also with variability, and we also changed the overall size of the image as well. And so the results for alpha two look like this. The different colors here are different imaging algorithms. And so um, we again treat each of these separately. We don't try to combine them and we have essentially three different, different alpha two calibrations and the alpha two calibration of each algorithm will be applied to the results of that algorithm.
And so in addition to imaging algorithms, we also have a geometric model fits. So the idea here is we have either a crescent or a ring with, with a different uh, surface brightness and we can fit these geometric models directly to the Fourier domain data. And so these are the results that we get from the Alpha 2 calibration of the synthetic data sets for these geometric models. And so at this point in my talk, I usually introduce the EHT, but obviously I'm not going to do that given um, what we have here. But I just want to say that if anybody is interested in chatting with me about any of the other kind of more broad EHT things, more than welcome to ask me questions about that. I'm happy to chat about it. Um, but I didn't want to uh, bore this particular group too much. So I'm going to skip the rest of the tour um, and get to the image, which I'm sure everybody has also seen a lot. So we are so excited that we finally got to share this image with the world. Um, we did work on this for, for many years. We're very excited that, that we finally got something that we're really, really happy and confident with. And um, I won't go into too many of the details of all of the kind of difficulties that, that Sajay Star uh, provided for us, because again, I'm sure um, most people here have heard. But what I wa do want to do is talk just a little bit about what the actual space of possible images looks like and how it relates to what we did for paper six. So in this image over here, you'll see that there's these four smaller panels. These are the results of what happens when we apply a clustering algorithm to all of the images that we have from these imaging algorithms. And specifically, I want to focus on this cluster right here. These little kind of histograms here are showing you the relative occurrence of each of these different clusters. So this one looks a little less ringy, but it's a really, really small percentage of the overall images that we have. What I want to emphasize, though, is that in all of our analysis for paper six, we do not remove these images. We do not exclude them in any way. They're completely part of our error bars. Okay, and that's really important. Um, so our analysis does not actually depend on us having a very clear ring. We can do all of our analysis with um, an image that, that looks more like kind of free, free um, bright spots. And so this plot here is showing you the results of actually applying the same feature extraction algorithm to all of these images that we have. Again, each different uh, imaging algorithm is treated separately, but they are all broadly consistent with each other. In addition to imaging, we also do this for the model fitting, right? So again, geometric model fitting in for a space. This, these are some examples of what these geometric fits look like, and then these are the actual mean diameters that we get from those fits. So in addition to alpha 1 and alpha 2, obviously we need to know what the mass and distance of the black hole is so that we can know what the predicted size for the black hole shadow actually is. So for Sajay star, of course, we're extremely lucky that we have really, really exquisite mass over distance measurements. We have two of them, in fact, and um, they're not completely consistent with each other, which is a really important part of this. So um, we were in a fairly constant contact with both groups and we try to be um, very fair with both groups and so the way that we approach this was instead of trying to choose one over the other or instead of trying to combine them in any way we again did our full analysis assuming one and then did everything all over again assuming the other um, and what you'll find what I'll show you is that it really doesn't change our final error bars that much if you assume one or the other everything we do is actually consistent with either one of these measurements okay so this is a very busy uh, slide, and I do apologize for that, but I color-coded things to hopefully make it a little bit easier to, to get through. So I, I've been saying, right, that we did our whole analysis many times. Yes, these are all of the uh, delta error bars that we uh, calculated here. And so in blue, uh, these are all of the results from assuming uh, the VLTI mass over distance measurement and for all of the three different uh, imaging algorithms and the three different alpha one calibration. In green, same thing, but instead of VLTI, it's for Keck, and in pink, it's everything for the geometric model fits. Um, this is kind of a lot, so we tried to simplify it for you. <laughs> this looks significantly better, um, I would argue at least. And so essentially this pink band here contains all of the different posteriors that we get for all of the results from the imaging algorithms. And so the point here is that even though we have done this in many different ways, no matter what we assume, we end up with really similar 
final error bars on our delta parameter. Okay, so it's about plus or minus 10% is what we're left with at the end. Here we also compare to the results from M87. You'll notice that we have a much more stringent error bar for SAJ star than for M87. I would love to take the credit for that and say that it's we've just learned so much in the last few years that we're able to analyze the HT data so much better that we have a much better error bar, but that's really not why. The real reason is just from this mass over distance prior. Because we have such a um, really exquisite mass over distance prior, we're able to achieve a much better error bar. So for comparison, SAJ star is about plus or minus 10%, and M87 is about 17%. Right? So it's almost a factor of two improvement, but again, that really comes from this mass over distance prior. I should have also said, this blue band here, this corresponds to um, the full prediction for Kerr, right? So the, re the reason there's a width is um, due to the fact that we don't know the spin or the inclination. So essentially, if at any point we have a distribution that only allows like, you know, a part of this blue band, then we would be able to constrain spin and or inclination or a combination of the two. But as you can tell, all of the different spins and inclinations are completely consistent with what we have. Um, so we can say that it's consistent with curve, but we cannot really rule out any part of the curve parameter space. Um, this is just for you to see pictorially what this actually looks like compared to the image. So the dashed curves are these error bars that I'm quoting. Okay. So one of the things that I like to do is run simulations of what happens if you take Kerr and you kind of mess with it. Okay, so these are metrics that um, have been developed over the last few decades that parametrically are different from Kerr. And they have several different deviation parameters and you can kind of play around and explore uh, a significant part of the allowed parameter space for what black hole geometry could look like if you loosen some of the assumptions that um, go into the Nohair theorem. And so, for example, here I have two parametrized metrics. Uh, JP stands for Johansson and Pasaltis, and MGBK stands for Modified Gravity Bumpy Kerr. That's the metric of Vigilant, Eunice, and Stein. In each of these, I am just changing one deviation parameter, and that's the deviation parameter that has the largest effect on the size of the shadow. And so this is all done uh, numerically. And so for Kerr, right, I had this whole argument about how the spin doesn't really affect the size and the shape of the shadow. And a reason for why it doesn't affect the size and the shape of the shadow is because Kerr is so perfectly symmetric and just really beautiful, right? So when we were working with these metrics, we were kind of assuming that spin was going to end up having a much bigger effect and that we would break this asymmetry and we'd end up with a much stronger dependence on spin. That turns out to not be the case. Even for these weird metrics, they still don't depend on spin that much. So in these uh, two subplots here, um, in each of these, we're again changing one deviation parameter and seeing how the size of the black hole shadow changes. So deviation parameter versus size, but the different colors are for different spins. So even with these really weird metrics, um, the spin really doesn't seem to affect the size of the shadow that much. And so for paper six, I ran tens of thousands of simulations of non kerr black holes. And they all went into this plot over here, which I do apologize, is, is a little tricky to look into. What I'm really showing you here is essentially a cross-section of a hyperdimensional space of all of these different parameters that you can vary. And so I'm going to try to walk you through it. JP is um, on the left, MGPK is on the right. The shaded region in all of these are the regions that are ruled out by this new 10% error bar. Spin always increases as you go to the right in each of these panels. And the top two are showing you the effect of the secondary deviation parameter. And so the different colors and, and different symbols correspond to different values for the secondary deviation parameter. And on the bottom, it's the same thing, but instead of this deviation parameter, it's the effect of inclination. What should you actually take away from this? <laughs> the point here is that we achieve order unity constraints on these deviation parameters. What I want you to keep in mind, though, is that even though the spin does have a little bit of an effect, right, it can change between three or two or so forth, um, we really don't worry too much about things at that level. We want to know if it's order unity or if it's 10, <laughs> right? Um, if it's 1.2 or 1.4, we're not that worried about it. And so we quote all of these constraints um, numerically where we do allow multiple things to vary at a time. But then we also do an analytic 
analysis where we allow only one thing to vary at a time and we essentially ignore the effect of spin. And so in this analytic analysis, each of these um, each of these lines are showing you what happens when you allow just one deviation parameter to vary in one of these parameterized metrics. The middle and rightmost panels are not parameterized metrics, but metrics that are specific solutions to either modified gravity theories or if you're changing something else, right, you're adding a charge or it's naked singularity or something like that. Um, and so the point here, shaded regions again ruled out, the point here is that we can already start placing constraints on some known solutions to alternative theories, right? So we can rule out a wormhole, for example, which is always kind of fun, um, especially for the public. Um, but if you don't care about testing gravity, you might be sitting there thinking, why should, why should you care about this, right? So you might not have heard about these different modified gravity theories. You might not have heard about these parameterized metrics. So what should the general astrophysical population really kind of take home from this? Um, so to do that, there's a little bit more math, but we're almost getting there. So if you write your metric in aerial coordinates, what you can show is that the photon orbit only depends on the time-time component of the metric. And the short shot, sorry, the shadow radius also depends only on the time-time component of the metric. So what we're really doing when we measure the size of the black hole shadow is we are constraining the time-time component of the metric. And that's the same part of the metric that's constrained, for example, of the precession of Mercury's orbit around the sun. If we compare to those results of the precession of Mercury's orbit around the sun, we are over 500 times more stringent than what can be done in the solar system. So that's the take home message for, for you if you don't care about the details of, of these different uh, deviation parameters. And so the way that we compare what we can do with the EHT to what other tests of gravity can do is using the parametric post-Newtonian framework. So PPN is originally developed to be used in the weak field regime. I really want to emphasize, though, we are not actually using PPN for our constraints themselves. All we are doing is comparing the results that we have from the parameterized metrics that are specifically made to be used in the strong field regime. We're just comparing those results to PPN because that's literally the only way that anybody in the testing gravity community can talk to each other. This is the best we have. Um, it's the only way that we can compare. And so the point here is that we can relate constraints on these deviation parameters to these kappa parameters. And so when I say, oh, we're doing hundreds of times better than what can be done in the solar system, what I really mean by that is that our constraint on kappa 2, which is the second order post-Newtonian parameter, is over 500 times stronger than what you can do in the solar system. That's how these two things are related. And then this is what I consider to be our money plot. So when I was here a decade ago, um, when I was an IU student, I remember uh, talking to several people being like, I want to use black holes in space to test fundamental physics. I want to test gravity in the strong field regime with black holes. And they all told me that that wasn't a thing that we could do yet, which is very true, right? So at the time, we did not have a single one of these data points on this plot. And I just think it's so wonderful that just in the last few years, we are able to perform strong field tests of gravity with black holes in space over 10 orders of magnitude and mass, right? So these two plots here, gravitational wave detections, right? So solar mass black holes. And then we have Sajay Star and M87, which are supermassive black holes. And so we are achieving comparable constraints with the EHT to what we have with these gravitational wave uh, detections. This gray shaded band is again the prediction for GR allowing for different spins and different inclinations. And um, it really is kind of the birth of a new way of, of using black holes to really test fundamental physics in a way that we really haven't been able to do before. Yeah, so these are violin plots. So um, don't, don't worry about this direction, but in this direction, that's really showing you how stringent our constraints are. So when you compare the width in this direction of the gravitational waves to Sag star, you'll see that we're achieving comparable constraints. When you compare to M87, that's when you see that we have a, a little bit larger of an error bar, and that's really due to the fact that we don't have a super great constraint on the mass of M87. Any other questions? OK. Floor, how are we doing on time? Because I can, I have a few more things. Yeah? Okay. Okay. So 
I already kind of alluded to this, but why does it matter that we're probing different uh, black hole masses, right? So both of these tests, gravitational waves, and um, also what we can do with the EHT are in the strong field regime, we're actually at a really similar gravitational radius from the black hole, so we're probing a really, really similar gravitational potential. However, curvature is different because we are probing very, very different masses. And so this is kind of a, a larger parameter space of different tests of gravity. Almost all tests of gravity are on here. And you can see that we're kind of carving out a different or new part of the parameter space where we really didn't have a whole lot of information before the EHT, which is, um, of course, very exciting. OK, so the other thing that we asked ourselves when we were working on paper six, and I should be very clear, this section is led by Ramesh. Um, and I'm very grateful for you for having led this section. Um, do our results require the existence of an event horizon? So we considered two different models here. So one of the models is you have a, instead of an event horizon, you have a surface that's outside of the event horizon that is going to absorb all of the incident radiation. It's going to get heated up, reach thermal equilibrium, and then re-emit that radiation firmly. So this is a model that's been around in the literature for quite some time. You've probably heard Ramesh talk about it at some point. But what's really important here is that one of the three parameters in this model is the overall size of the emission region. And that's really what the EHT was able to kind of add to this picture. Right Now that we have this image of Sajay star, we have a really strong constraint on what the maximum size of the emission region can be. And when we add that to the model, what we end up with are these solid black lines you see here. Okay, So the difference between these lines comes from different accretion rates. So again, we have better constraints on that with the EHT as well. And what we're really able to show here, essentially, is that if we had a thermal surface, the emission in the infrared would be so much higher than what we actually observe from real Sag star data, which are these, shown as these points here. So effectively, with this new size measurement from the EHT, we can rule out a uh, thermal emitting surface, which is really, really exciting because, you know, black holes should have event horizons, but it's really great to actually go out and prove that, um, that alternatives are, are inconsistent with the data. So in addition to a thermal surface, we also considered a reflective surface. And so the top row here is what the image looks like for a normal black hole that has an event horizon. And the bottom row is the same black hole, but now with a reflective surface. And so the point here is that we're creating this additional inner ring here that comes from this re reflected emission that otherwise would not have been there. And so you see a blurred image, and you see what an actual real realistic observation would look like with the EHT. And effectively, we can now rule out a perfectly reflective surface. Um, but if you have a lower albedo on your reflective surface, there is still some room um, that you could kind of squeak by. Um, I do want to emphasize, though, so the model that I just talked about with the firmly em emitting surface, that model's been around for a really long time and is pretty uh, robust and has been kind of fleshed out. This is a newer model. Um, and so this simulation, for example, ignores spin. We have not done a full study of what the effect of spin would be, um, but it's still a really, really encouraging result because this is something that the EHT should be able to do much, much better with in the uh, short future, <laughs> not so distant future, because it adds emission specifically in the, the shadow region that we are hoping to be able to constrain more, more um, strongly in the future. And so with that, I will just go through my summary real quick. Um, so the first image of Sag J star is completely consistent with the predictions for a Kerr black hole. Not super surprising, but always encouraging. <laughs> um, we use hundreds of thousands of Kerr and non-Kerr simulations to calibrate our uncertainty. And we arrive at about a 10% uncertainty on the diameter of the black hole shadow. We use this uncertainty to constrain deviations away from Kerr, both parametrically and with specific known solutions. We also consider alternatives to an event horizon. We can rule out a thermal surface and uh, start placing important constraints on a reflective surface as well. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. Yeah, so I was just wondering about the time variability in, in this image. This is from the alpha one time variability. Where, where does that come from? Time variable accretion rates, uh, dynamical instabilities, turbulence? I love that question because that was my entire PhD. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, 
um, so during my PhD, I was looking at specifically how the variability that we see in these images are going to be manifest in the Fourier domain and how that's going to affect our, um, our ability to make an image with the EHT, but also looking at why is it that we see the variability that we see, right? So there's a few different things going on here. So we do have a very turbulent accretion flow. Right? So you can think of it as having these kind of burbles around the flow due to MHD turbulence. But on top of that, we're also going to have to worry about how is that turbulence going to affect the emissivity that we actually see. Right, So it's going to change the magnetic field. It's going to change what we see in terms of um, the emissivity that you would expect. So for example, you might have situations where you have magnetic reconnection. Right, that's something that actually isn't really included in this particular simulation, but it is something that a lot of people in the EHT and in the larger communities are working really hard on is understanding how a magnetic reconnection event might affect what we were to see. So for example, when you see a really bright uh, X-ray flare, for example, that is probably due to a magnetic reconnection event, right? But then when you're looking at this, my argument is what's really going on here is that you have these burbles, right? And you have this, this kind of turbulence in the flow. But on top of that, you also have to deal with the fact that this is being lensed. So um, I don't have it in my extra slides, but if you want, I can show you a, a movie later on that, that will kind of emphasize what I'm about to say, which is when you have a kind of bright blob that crosses behind a really particular region of the black hole, that's when you end up with these lens structures. And so it's really a combination of the turbulence of the flow itself and also the fact that this is going to be getting in lensed in and out of you. So I argue that in most cases, what we actually see is going to be primarily determined by lensing because the specific details of the structures are going to be really kind of warped by, by the lensing effect. This is actually a counterexample to that, and that's because it is almost perfectly face on. And so um, you'll end up having less uh, of these kind of warping effects than, than what you would see for a more edge on case. But yeah, so, so the variability, of course, is a really, really important aspect of, of everything we do with the EHD. Other question, part, part of the other, this question. So there, there's a, a turbulent um, plasma like foreground with respect to the observations. And where does that come in? Is that in alpha 2, or is that part of the Yeah. Um, alpha 1? OK, hold on. This I actually do have. OK, so <laughs> if I had had more time, you would have gotten to see this. Um, these are little packets of photons going towards a black hole, and we're seeing how the lensing affects it. So you're saying what happens to the emission that's essentially right here, right between us and the black hole. Um, so a couple things go on with that. So for, for one thing, it's going to be demagnified due to redshift and also Doppler beaming and boosting. And so we will have not a ton of brightness there. But if you look in this movie, Right, the fact that there is some emission right here is essentially mostly from stuff that's really between us and the black hole. And so that is all part of our alpha one calibration. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, um, I was curious about you have this alpha one, alpha two decomposition. The alpha one is where you get, if you have a perfect image, right? It's, it's no instrumental uncertainties. And it's pretty striking that our final uncertainty is pretty similar to that alpha one calibration. So it's about a factor of two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and if we want to get to say percent level uncertainties or measurements of spin, it, you know, it's kind of hard to beat that one down. So, so what do you think? Is this yeah. the framework for the future? Do you think it's going to move to something else? Yeah. yeah. Great question. Um, very valid question. <laughs> So one of the things um, to keep in mind, right, is that that alpha one calibration does not make any cuts on the models, right? So for example, there are ways that you can go put your black hole in a part of the accretion regime where you're creating a really thick ring. Those cases, you will end up with a larger alpha one calibration, for example. So one of the ways that we could improve upon this is that if we have an image where we constrain the width of the ring much more precisely, it will essentially, or it could be used to rule out a really large part of the alpha one parameter space and would lead to a uh, significantly better total alpha one calibration factor. 
For paper six, we made a point of not making those kinds of cuts because we wanted it to be very conservative and as general as possible. But there are ways that you could um, kind of use what we know about accretion to, to really improve upon that. Another thing, right, is that looking at what happens several years uh, Right, several observations, se several realizations of turbulence will also, I think, be really, really valuable here. Um, and so we can really start to um, make a, a maybe a new way of dealing with alpha one, where we're not just looking at, you know, what is the probability that a black hole accretion flow can create a ring that is slightly different at one point in time, but actually looking at what is the probability that a black hole accretion flow can create a ring of different size that is constant a, as a function of time, right? So that is a different question, and, and I haven't actually gone through that exercise, but I expect that alpha one would be significantly improved in that case. But again, that, that's not what was done in, in paper six, because we wanted to be very conservative and, and allow for the possibility that if it's possible to make it one time, it's going to be part of our error bar, yeah. Daniel? Sure, yeah. I'll pause the talk. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, yeah, so I guess in sort of in line with Michael's question, and I think you're probably referring to one of these models, there are these same models that are more high of one, which is protons and electrons are thermalized, they end up being super puffy, and they have these big, you know, their typical emission radii is very far from the photon. But there are neon signs in nature telling us, no, you should be looking at moderately spinning mads, so these magnetically arrested disks with very cold electrons, very high on high. So there are very few models in Sanjay Star Paper 5 that are sort of best bet, really. I'm curious, if you redo the alpha calibration just with those models that we think are decent, how tight does it get? I'm not going to have uh, the error bar off the top of my head. But what yeah, I can but... tell you, though, which is relevant to what you just said, is we ended up actually not including our high equals 1 in the final thing. I, we did those plots with our high equals one, and they're like indistinguishable. So specifically, our high equals one really doesn't actually change things that much, which is interesting, and was uh, was not quite what I expected. Um, yeah. So so in terms of our high equals one, it's not in in the final answer in paper six, but we did do that exercise, and it really didn't change it that much. Um, if we were to make uh, additional cuts, um, I think it would improve, um, but I do think that you will hit a, a wall at, at one point or another, right? Like, I think that wall is probably a, at around 3%, um, but that's very hand wavy, right? 3% plus or minus 2 is what I would claim, <laughs> right? And so um, so I think that there is some room for, for improvement, um, but but it's not going to get at a sub-percent level. Um, and I think that's the important point that I think Michael was getting to. You can beat down alpha too by doing better and better yep. experiment. Make it zero, let us yep. But, but you're yeah. saying that this three person will still be there. Yeah, yeah. Which at some point, right, you, you start asking different questions, right? Like what the probability is that, that this will um, exist at many, uh, many different realizations of the turbulence, you'll end up with the same ring, right? So that's a different question, and that would be a different analysis. You also could ask the question, what's the chances of it having the same size for 0.8 versus 1.3, which is one of the things I'm really excited about for going to the shorter wavelength, which you probably all know, but the EHT is planning to observe at a shorter wavelength, hopefully this year. And um, you know, you would ask different questions of what is the probability that you'd end up with a different ring um, in both wavelengths, for example, right? So, so there could be different ways to approach the problem that I think can start to drive this down. But at least in, um, in the way that we are calibrating things Right now, like within this framework, I do think you will reach a, a wall. Yeah, that there is this kind of intrinsic uh, theoretical uncertainty. I, I would be shocked if somebody came to me and said that they had a way to achieve sub percent uh, alpha one calibration. They would really have to work hard to convince me of that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so coming this from a completely separate field, is it a meaningful and feasible task to either measure or rule out? Um, the proper motion of Sanjay's star using EHT. Say it had a darker canyon. <laughs> <laughs> um, great question. I got I got that question earlier today too. Um, so there is uh, really exciting work by Jordi Develer, who is uh, looking at um, what the effects would be if there were a a black hole binary, for example, and can rule out parts of the parameter space. But I want to make one thing clear, though, in what you just said. Um, 
With what we have of the EHT right now, we don't have absolute phase information. We have closure phase information. And what the take home message of that is, is that we don't actually have information about the absolute location of our beautiful ring on the sky. So if it's moving, <laughs> um, we're not actually sensitive to that. Um, if it's moving on timescales that are short enough that would create um, essentially effectively a, a variability, um, maybe. But, but I don't know if, if our algorithms would actually be able to, to find something like that. Um, so anyways, all that being said, um, there is active work from EHT members that, that is very exciting on ruling out a possible dark companion. There are parts of the parameter space that are ruled out. You should absolutely check out uh, Jordi's work. Um, but in terms of whether we'll be able to notice that it moved ever so slightly, that's a, a little harder for us to, to actually do in practice. But if anybody has an idea of how to make the EHT be able to get absolute phase referencing, I am all ears because um, one of the things you probably noticed with respect to spin is that when you increase spin, it moves. So if we were able to measure with, with great precision the location of the actual center of mass versus the location of, of our shadow, um, that could be a way to, to constrain spin, for example, yeah. Fresh? So, Leah, mm -hmm. I was kind of caught by surprise with this factor of 500 improvement compared to the Mercury orbit, right? And yeah, I was on this paper, <laughs> but I obviously I didn't read that section. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, so it's actually not in the paper. Thank you. I thought <laughs> I read it. <laughs> Thing that we tell the, the media, but we didn't actually put it in the paper. Put it in the yeah. paper. Okay, so but I want to understand this guy. Yeah. So, is the claim that GTT is being constrained better by EHT compared to solar system? All solar system tests or only the Mercury test? So, it's very specific. Yeah. It is the second order post Newtonian parameter in GTT. GTT. The fact that it's second order is what gives us that really, really strong okay. ability to constrain it, right? And the whole point, right, is that we're in the strong field regime. Like, that's the whole point that we do these tests is that we are sensitive to higher order deviation. And that's why we arrive at this over 500 um, thing. To be completely honest, this 500 number comes from the PRL 2020 paper that we did on M87. And it's about 500 for M87. So it's probably closer to 1,000 for, for SAG A. But I don't remember the actual number off the top of my head. So I'm saying over 500 because I know the error bar is better than what we have for, for M87. Yeah, but that's. Um, the reason it's not in in the Sajay Star paper and the reason you haven't heard about it is that this number originally came from when we were working on that other paper. Right. So, but just to finish that, um, in the solar system, apart from Mercury's orbit, there's also the lensing, right? People have seen the bending of light by whatever, one and a half uh, arc second and all that. And that is, you know, it's a real lensing effect. And it's similar to this, except that it's one yeah. Box, yeah. Um, if I remember, accurate, if, if I remember correctly, the the place we got this number from is uh, a review article by Cliff Wild that takes all of that into account and then has a final answer, and we just use that final answer. Okay. But I can't, I don't actually remember which one ended up being the most constraining. But I know that it was it was a, a review article that took all of these different uh, tests into account and had a final constraint on 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 this. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. So you'll have to forgive me for not knowing much about post-Newtonian correct. I'm happy to see you again. How are you? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's surprising to me that if you're in the strong field regime that you wouldn't just be swamped by like higher order terms, right? Like cap three, cap four, cap, I don't know. Like what, what terms actually matter? <laughs> One second. <laughs> um, okay, so the shadow radius for the JP metric, you do need to actually make an assumption of, of which parameterized metric you're using here. And this comes from the fact that like we're actually making our constraints in these parameterized metrics and we're not using PPN to actually make the constraints because you can't use PPN for black holes, but you can compare it to PPN. So this is what the actual expansion looks like. Um, Originally, when we first wrote the paper, we were using zeta. We changed the kappa. I apologize that I did not update this. These are the same kappa parameters. I just wasn't planning on showing this slide. Um, it converges, but very slowly, right? So, so there's about a factor of four or five um, with each one. So it does converge. Um, it's just 
it's not like down by a factor of 100, right? So like, yes, you are a little bit sensitive to these higher orders. You do need to be a little bit concerned with that. But in terms of, oh, hey, we're placing order unity constraints, that statement isn't really affected by this. Yeah, yeah. And we've done, you know, we, we've explored like what happens when you allow multiple things to, to vary at a time. And, and we really haven't been able to, to break the, the main results that, that we have. But, but it's a very good question, yeah. yeah. And with that, I'm going to say uh, Lai is still around today and most of tomorrow morning and early afternoon. So feel free to sign up to meet with her or um, see her at my coffee. And thank you so much for the great talk. Thank you.